Okay, so we are going to continue with warping and how to weave on a rigid heddle loom. So we've already done the warping process and we are at that same point where you are ready to start weaving. And I'm gonna show you how to start the process and then we're also gonna show you how to take it off when you're done. So I have the finished one as well so that you can, this will be the rest of this, the thing, okay? So the first thing you're gonna do is you are going to make sure you're comfortable in your chair, you have the right tension that you need. And the first thing you need to do is to start your sheds with either waste yarn, because you can use waste yarn for this as well, or the cardboard sticks that they give you, the warping sticks. And we're just gonna use the warping sticks for right now. I personally always start in the down position. That's me. All right, so I'm gonna go down and I'm gonna slide one cardboard piece in and pull it all the way down to the knot. You do not need to beat this. Up. The second one, like this, down, and now we're ready to go. Basically what this does is it helps to take away some of that spread. When you first tie on, you have wider places and you want to get it really so that it's almost back to normal, like this here. There's still some width here, but we're going to be okay with that in the beginning. It'll work its way out. So in the down position, I have my shuttle, and for me, I always start right to left because if I start the same way every time, I know that if my shuttle is on the right, my reed needs to be in the down position. And if my yarn and shuttle are on the left, my reed needs to be in the up position. It's just a way for me to know. Worst case scenario, if you have it in the wrong position, you're going to unweave one row. No biggie. You I'm just, good at that. You just put it back through. It's okay? Chris piping in, guys, every yeah, now and then. It's Chris. So here we go. So we're going to go in. And we're going to leave ourselves a tail halfway across, whatever. Because I'm going to show you how to weave this in as you go. So that you don't have to go back later and use a tapestry needle to weave stuff in. So here we are across. We're going to pull this down. And we're going to gently pull this until it's straight. I'm not making a rug. If you're making, <laughs> if you're making fabric, it's a kiss. Okay, you just want to bring it until everybody's lined up. Somehow I missed that in my very first rigid you heddle did. class. My my little scarf was a rug scarf. So the next thing you're going to do is you're going to put it in the up position. You're going to pass it through. So now this here is the thing you're going to learn some things here. So. If you take this and you pull on your yarn and you put your finger underneath and make sure that that warp thread is in line with how, where it comes out of the slot and then you take your other hand and you just gently pull until it lays there you don't want to do this you're going to have some issues so we're gonna pull this back out yeah, you'll get those wavy edges yes if you do that yes so the, the point is to do it as gently as possible. Just lay it there and at a bit of an angle, bring this down. If you tip the top back, go like this, you can actually see when it's lined up and then you stop and then we go back down and then we go from the other side and we're going to put this in. And same thing over here. You're going to hold this with your finger until it just touches. that, And even tug back just a little bit so that everybody's lined up. You don't want to pull it tight. I cannot stress how important it is not to pull it tight. And then just till it lines up. And then up. Now, Beauty of the Ashford Looms is... If you're working on a table, there are these notches at the back of the loom that actually go on the edge of your table. 
it sets it at an angle so you're looking down on your work it doesn't hurt your shoulders you're now not doing this you're right here it's better, better body motion. position absolutely feet planted on the floor you know <laughs> it's in a position yeah. where you don't hurt your hips you don't hurt your knees you know eventually everybody ends up on their toes but you don't need to do that just relax sit where it's nice and comfortable so now at this point i can lay this in my lap tug on that edge go like that let it go bring it down and down and awesome. once you get into a rhythm and i'm next to the table this is the 16 inch i'm not used to using the 16 inch typically i use the 10 but I have a specific use for this piece when it comes off, and I needed the width. So there you go. Now, this can, is your weaving. I want to ask a question. Sure. So when some people do what you're doing right now, and they go through, mm -hmm. instead of that angle, mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me, they bubble. Rainbow? Yeah. Why it's, do they rainbow? Same thing. So you have to give extra yarn. If you pull it flat like this, your yarn has nowhere to go. Yarn and your warp, your warp threads are going to do this kind of thing. And your yarn has to be able to do this. Oh, between your warp. In between okay. the warp threads. So you have to give it room to move, if that makes sense. Okay. And if you don't give that extra, um, you're going to bring it pulls piece the piece in. in. You're going to actually have a denser fabric. If that's okay. what you're going for, fine. But if you're making something that needs to be drapey, you can't do that. You also have to understand, too, when you're weaving, you're weaving under tension. Your warp is tensioned. And so you're going to have space. So come in here. Can you see? They're not exactly all the way up against each other. There's some space. Mm -hmm. When you release this off of the loom, it's going to pull. Oh, the tension is okay. going to release yep. this way and this way a little bit. It's going to happen. You can't get away from it. And those gaps fill in those when it does that. Those gaps fill the... in. Okay. So you have to understand trying to get it so that the threads are right next to either each other where you want it to be when it's done. You're going to make it thicker than what it really is. That was my problem when I first started. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to realize that that's the situation but okay. that's the way it is and then when you're doing your when you're weaving mm -hmm. can you use anything for to your for your weft so are there rules in weaving when you're doing the weft which is the left to right actually weaving this here's the warp warp is important it's under tension it can't stretch <laughs> but when you're going back and forth this direction for mm -hmm. the weft you can use anything you want. It okay. doesn't matter. Okay. Because it's not under tension. Okay. It's not going to break. Just wanted to know. Yeah. You can use and roving materials. Does the yarn or whatever you're using to weave with back and forth for your weft, does it matter with how what you've got warped with? Like what size okay. reed you used or anything yeah, like so that? If you're doing a really fat yarn or say you're using a fabric because you did that that one I time did we used uh batiks yep materials that you had stripped down you need to give more space between the warp threads in order for that to have a place to go yeah. so I think we went to a five we went we? to a five yep so all that means instead of seven and a half warp threads per inch we used something that had five warp threads okay. per inch and it gave more space in between okay. now ashford goes all the way down to 2.5 yeah stitches per inch so if you're using roving or thicker materials that gives more space now that doesn't need to mean that you need to use a chunky yarn in your warp you can use the thinner even like this okay this is size 10 crochet thread Okay. Okay, size 10 thread. It's just how far apart it's spaced. It's how far apart it is okay. and what you're going to weave with. Okay. So there are things that you need to take into consideration for when you are making a project. Okay. Um, and those are things that we talk about when we're teaching. Okay. 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 Sorry, so now, I was just curious. Yeah. Um, 
So now what we need to do, I'm gonna move this out of the way. So you kind of got an idea on that. I do want to touch on one thing here that I couldn't touch on there. Yeah. All right. When you get to a point up by the reed and your um, shuttle's not going to go through anymore, you need to advance your project. To advance your project, you put your hand back here and you gently, it's a small movement, because what it does is it releases pressure off of this here so that you can easily click it back. If you leave it like that and it's under tension, it's harder to get it off. <laughs> Plus, your hand also has control so it doesn't go flying. Okay. Release this, take the front one, and you wind on until your fabric is like right about here, this area, okay. um, because your shuttle can go up to that point. And then you lock this, re-engage is the word I was looking for. And then you just gently tension again with this one, not this one, until you have where you want to be and then you can continue weaving. Okay. Okay, so now, I work this way. <laughs> I'm this way so you can actually film it. Yeah. Scissors. All right. So now I'm done. All right. So now I need to get this off of here. So I do this pretty quickly. You cut the first one, cut the next two. Cut behind the reed. You're cutting off of the back beam. Excuse me. I do everything in fours. So the first four threads, I just do a half knot slip knot, bullion knot, whatever you want to call it, tighten it. Do the next two. So this is the extra piece. You're always going to have one extra because your first piece that you tied on was a single thread, yarn, whatever. And if you hold the knot and pull and then hold the fabric and pull, because if you do this, you're going to Pull your warp thread. You don't want to pull your warp thread. I really like the colors in that one. Don't you like that? That's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. It's um. So this is actually Lion Brand suede, but it really feels like a chenille. It does feel like a chenille. That's why I kept looking at it. I'm like, huh. And then I had this blue cotton that I used. I have a lot of this blue cotton <laughs> for whatever reason. Looks really good with that. Yeah. So as you see, this is not a, it's not, it's not that it's not a quick process, but it's not that slow either. And then if you're making a scarf, you've got fringe. There is another technique that we will show later. Um, there's this thing called hem stitching. And you have to decide that you're going to do hem stitch at the beginning of your project because you need to do the hem stitch in the beginning at the front of your project before you actually start advancing. I still struggle with the hem stitch. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. It's just something that doesn't. You know, once you practice it, if that thing is like, oh, this is really fast, it's easy. And if you don't want fringe on a project, that's the thing to do. So a lot of people are making tea towels or placemats and they don't want any fringe. They'll do the hem stitch at the beginning and the end. So you know what I've done? Mm -hmm. Is I've just made sure that I weave extra fabric mm -hmm. and then I go visit my sewing machine mm -hmm. and I, and I, you know, cut off my fringe yep. and then fold it over and sew because um, me and that hem stitch again. Yeah. I just feel like I do it wrong every single time I do it. I just haven't got confident with it yet. Right. And me... I don't like to sew, so I'm going to do the other thing. Right. Now, we did have, so when you're doing placemats and tea towels and things like that, you can actually work for more than one at a time. Yep. And then you can, it's like three or four that you can get on your loom, and you do that hem stitch in between each one, then you leave a space and you keep on going. Well, Jim actually was making placemats, and so he brought in to show me what he had done, and he hadn't cut them apart yet. Well, where he did the hem stitch and left space in between the cut, it was a great detail. Oh, it looked like that floating warp. Yes. Yeah, so what he did was he decided to leave that 
as a table runner. Oh, that's so funny. And then make placemats again. That's perfect. It was because everybody's like, oh, I remember you do that. It was so pretty. Yeah, it was. It was really nice. Okay, so you should end with four. Um, me, I'm just, it's one of those things I always make sure everything is divisible by four so it ends right. Sometimes that just doesn't happen. So that's how you do that end. Okay, you ready? And then you get the reveal. You unloosen this and you pull. Look at that. Look at that. Oh, that's so pretty. I made that long. You did. All right, then you flip it up. Now, real quick, right here at the beginning, mm -hmm. she used excess yarn instead of the sticks. Correct. So this is that other thing that you can do because then when you use a thick yarn, and as you can see, I doubled it. I just held it doubled. Um, you actually reduce the spacing quicker. Okay. So you need to pull this out. Now, if these were, see how I'm just pulling? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Comes right out. If um, I had the warp sticks in there, you have to remove the warp sticks before you can finish okay. this process. So now, because we tied on using the bow tie knots, it just unties and it's already in fours because I did it that way. Can yep. you see? Are my hands in the way? Come around this way. Yeah, come around this way. So again, listen, I'm not cameraman Bob here. No, but this is, it's not a slow process. It really doesn't take that much time. And people are like, oh, now I got to get it off of there. Well, this is easy to get off of there. They're, they're bows. Just undo the bow. You don't have to count. You don't have to cut anything. And I do it the exact same overhand knot that I did at the other end. And that's it. So it's really easy to work on a rigid huddle. And I hope these videos are something that you can use after you've taken a workshop or if you have a question. I've heard people already have gone back to that <laughs> first one you did. <laughs> they have. They have. Um, which is nice because it's exactly the way that I teach it. It's exactly the way that Ashford has it in the instructional books that come with the looms. Um, so it's a great, it's a great backup. Oh, absolutely. Um, so you can, you know, share and go, oh, I forgot how, she's not open. Well, I need to find that video. Well, it's right here for you to find. Absolutely. Yep. So there you go. Um, can you think of anything else I may have left out? Hmm. Um, so when you're done with this piece and you mm -hmm. take it off, is there anything that you're going to do to this piece so that it okay, so fluffs me, and all yeah. that stuff? So me personally, nah, oh, I, okay. I don't. But okay. what you should do, the next step <laughs> that you should do. So see this? This is where I had to tie on the next one because I ran out of the one skein. Okay. I'll just leave it in there. Comes part of the fringe. Um, so what you should do is you should you should soak it in um, eucalyptus is a recommended uh, no rinse wash. Um, like the fiber wash. Yeah. Is that what that is? Okay. Um, well, no, eucalyptus a little bit different. Is it? Yeah. Okay. With the fiber wash is just the soap, and then you have to rinse it and then use the rinse okay. to condition it. Um, the eucalyptus kind of does it all at once, and you don't have to rinse it. it there's no soap residue. Um, wow. Soak okay. it in a bowl of room temperature water. Learn something new every day. Yeah. Put a little bit in. Doesn't take a lot. Um, let your piece set for 30 to 45 minutes. Let it absorb as much water as possible um, in order for those fibers to bloom. What else you need to do is when after it's soaked... Um, gently squeeze, do not wring it or twist or any other um, mangling. Just gently squeeze the water out. Roll it in a big absorbent towel. And then um, lay it flat to dry. Okay. And that's that. And that'll help it bloom? That's that blocking process. Okay. 
and look at this. That's awesome. I got to back up. That's really long. I did make it long, but look at this. Oh, Janine, I love that. Thank you for making that for me. <laughs> Isn't this cool? Uh, and then now the fringe can be trimmed to be the same length. You can braid them. You can yep. fringe twist them. Anything that you want. Rotary cutters are a great tool for that. Absolutely. <laughs> we love rotary tools. Yeah. And the mats. They help you get your fringe straight. So there you go. Very nice. Yay. All right, Miss Janine. So, thank yes. you so, so much. Yeah. So this is how you finish your rigid huddle weaving. Um, like and share. Absolutely. Um, let your friends know that you saw the videos up on the YouTube video channel of the Blue Fiber Tree. And you know you can find all these workshops on the website of longtailknits.com. Absolutely. Facebook page Longtail Knits. And under the events tab, you get all that information. So I hope you enjoyed the process as much as we did. Happy rigid heddling. <laughs> heddling. Heddling. <laughs> I didn't know how to say that. Happy rigid. Happy, I can't even say it again. Happy, uh, happy, happy weaving, people. Yes, happy weaving. All right. So have a great day. Hope this works. And if you have any questions at all, you know how to get a hold of me. Bye. Okay, bye. <laughs>